So welcome everybody to this webinar as part of the Knowledge Rights 21 programme on book digitisation, online access and lending. What infrastructure is needed for success? This webinar is organised, as I said, within the context of the Knowledge Rights 21 programme, which I'll talk a little bit about later. My name is Stephen Weiber. I am Director for Policy and Advocacy at IFLO, which is one of the partner organisations within this. To be aware, this webinar is being recorded and we will be sharing it afterwards. However, the chat is not being recorded, and so you can ask, you can make comments in the chat, and you can ask questions. These will not be shared. Only the presentations, what's said by the panelists, will be shared in that way. So, to give you a quick sense at the beginning, you've signed up for the webinar, you've looked at the blurb, but just to underline quickly what the goals of this webinar are, is that. Um, we're in a situation, I'm, I'm not going to say anything original here, or we're not going to win any prizes for originality, but clearly digital and the internet in general have changed things when it comes to how we create, manage, give access to and apply information. Already back in 1971, the Gutenberg project saw the potential, starting to digitise books, and this now represents one of the world's biggest online repositories of work in the public domain. The open access movement itself also is arguably the result of the rise of digital, which upended old assumptions about how the dissemination of scholarship should and could work. It gives a glimpse of what's possible. Clearly, digital does raise a whole load of legal questions. Some are already being addressed. For example, fair use allowed for activities like that of the Hattie, Hattie Trust in the US during the pandemic. While in the EU, we've seen reforms in 2019 designed to make it possible to digitize and give access to out of commerce works. Of course, currently, the case opposing the internet archive and publishers is drawing a lot of attention. However, what we want to do today here today is rather focus on the more practical side of things. This is because the shift to digital is not a tide that lifts all boats equally, but rather has seen some players, some institutions, some people adopt quicker than others, creating unevenness. This is certainly the case in the library field, where some have been able to seize opportunities in order to maximize the potential of digital to deliver on library missions by digitizing, giving access to, and lending works. But clearly, this is not the case for all. There are various reasons why other libraries are not able to seize this opportunity, but high among them will be concerned about the potential complexity and cost and how such processes can be integrated into workflows. This therefore is the focus of our session today. We're not going to have the 101st discussion about the legal aspects of digitization, lending and giving access, but rather want to look at how libraries are finding ways of realizing the potential of digital technologies in a way that works for them. And I set out on this slide, how to make this as simple as possible, how to integrate this into workflows and provide lessons that I hope for as many of you as possible in the audience, you can then apply in your own libraries and your own work. We're very lucky to count on some excellent speakers, some of whom have got up very early in the morning, who've been very generous with their time and expertise and who've agreed to take part. Alan Jones, who will be our first speaker, is Director, Digital Library and Technical Services at the New School, where he's worked in different roles for over 20 years. He sets out his goal as being to develop innovative ways to service the needs of academic libraries in an accessible way by implementing emerging technologies and reducing user friction in the patron discovery journey. He's a member of the project management team for Project Reshare, which brings together a wide variety of actors with the goal of creating a user-centered, app-based, community-owned resource sharing platform for libraries to set the standard for how we connect library patrons to the resources and information they require. He'll be talking about the technological angle, the back-end tools which make it possible for libraries to share content with each other and with users. We will then have Tommy Keswick, who is Digital Technologies Development Librarian at the California Institute of Technology, or Caltech, a role that he's held for seven years now. He's combined development work with libraries, including the Statewide California Electronic Library Consortium, and time working on cataloging, digital asset management and teaching. He'll be focusing on the academic library experience, and in particular around giving access to course materials in line with wider institution policies. David Leonard is president of Boston Public Library. He began working at the library in 2009, holding a number of roles before being named president. Previously, he worked in the technology, management and consulting fields. He has a strong focus on developing the library as a 21st century institution, 
that provides dynamic library experiences to the residents of Boston, of Massachusetts and beyond. David will give us the perspective of a library which is both public and has a research function. And we'll look at questions around how to make the infrastructure for sharing management uh, integrated, sharing management integrated with current workflows and policies. Finally, we're lucky to have Jenny Rose Halperin, who's a digital strategist, community builder and librarian, and leads Library Futures, which itself works to promote equitable library policy, technology and advocacy, and is doing some really exciting work, so do check them out. She previously worked at Harvard Law School Library, as well as spending time with Creative Commons, O'Reilly Media and Mozilla. And she's got the task of asking questions of our other speakers and bringing things together a bit at the end. So I said earlier, I'd give you a quick introduction to what Knowledge Rights 21 is. And I will keep this short because there's information up on our website. The reason behind Knowledge Rights 21 is because we've assessed and we see that the approach within policy making to supporting research, education and culture, in particular in Europe, is often incomplete, it's fragmented, it's not taken seriously, it's that we need to promote a different way of thinking about these aspects, these key human rights, these key development goals, and actually promote them, come up with policies that actually consider them the way we take action. We're not there yet. To do this, we're looking to sustainably mobilise the experiences, the voices, the energy of libraries and other access to knowledge advocates and provide them support in their work, practically and with evidence with other tools. Through this, we hope to deliver practical policy and political change in key areas around eBooks, which will be a big focus today, around questions like contract override, open norms, secondary publishing rights and rights retention. We hope that you're interested, that we hope that you agree with these goals and that you're looking forward to get involved. If you are, please do think about engaging in our national networks We've recently uploaded a list of our new national coordinators to our website, and you've got the link to the website down below. Take a look, see if there's someone in your country, get in touch, join networks. We are also carrying out research, looking to fill the evidence gaps that there are in discussions around copyright and open access right now. Again, keep an eye on the website, answer surveys, but get in touch if you think you can share things. For example, about how your experience, the problems you face, the challenges you face, where the law is falling short. Overall, look out for further information and opportunities by email on so and on social media. You'll see at the bottom right hand side of my screen the ha Twitter handle. So please do follow us. Please do look. We'll be live tweeting without this throughout this session. Look at our website, knowledgerights21.org. And if you want to get find out more, do get in touch directly at info at knowledgerights21.org. So with that, onto the session. So as I said, each of our speakers is going to speak for around 20 minutes. And after that, Jenny will be kind enough to answer, ask questions, to interact for a little bit. So we'll have about 20 minutes of 20 minutes for Alan, 20 minutes for Tommy, 20 minutes for David, then a little bit of Jenny. And then hopefully at the end, we have a little bit of time for broader questions and answers. So if you do have questions throughout, please use the Q&A function, especially for technical questions. It may be easier to answer directly in there. But overall, I wish you a very successful and interesting webinar and very glad that we have such a great group of people here with us now. So with that, over to you, Alan. Thanks. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here for a second. Um, I just, uh, uh, can you see this? Can you see the slide? Yep, okay. Yep, that's working fine. Yep. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Hi everyone. Uh, I'm absolutely. My name is Alan Jones. Uh, I work with uh, Jenny Rose Halperin on the uh, NISO um, uh, CDL uh, interoperability working group, um, as well as many of the very uh, many of the things that that Stephen also talked about. Um, what I'm hoping to actually talk a little bit about is to give you a little bit of context around some of the discussions that we've actually been having within that NISO group, um, not just to talk about what CDL is, or controlled digital lending or secure digital lending, not, not necessarily just talking about what it is, but also talking about some of the different architectural models that are, are coming out in the market as, as we see them. One of the other things that I'm gonna be talking about is the, uh, the own to loan functionality with, uh, with controlled digital lending, trying to keep the number of digital surrogates and the number of uh, physical items in, a, uh, uh, in sync. 
Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what some of those processes are, both uh, high tech as well as low tech um, that different libraries are actually adopting in order to make uh, controlled digital lending or secure digital lending possible. Um, I'm gonna be talking, uh, I'm gonna be providing a few examples around uh, the delivery systems that are also in the market and that are available today, as well as different types of uh, uh, systems that are emerging as well. And thankfully, uh, Tommy with uh, Dibs, as well as uh, a few other systems that hopefully you'll be seeing today, um, will give you a sense of kind of where, where the market is, where things are, are, are um, in production and where they're going. And then finally, I'm gonna conclude with some interoperability challenges that we're addressing within the, uh, within the CDL NISO group. First, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, controlled digital lending. Um, the way that the NISO group is actually uh, talking about it, it's, it's where libraries uh, um, lend digital surrogates in the same manner that they lend their print holdings. Um, putting different types of controls in place for things like copying and paste text, um, uh, uh, disabling printing in order to protect some of the intellectual property that's within those uh, materials. Um, every time that you secure something, you make it less usable to a particular population. So part of what we're balancing is the issue of accessibility um, for as many uh, differently abled populations, um, and also this this notion of protecting content as well. Um, one of the one of my colleagues within the Columbia University Libraries, uh, Rob Cardellano, says the job of this group is actually to make CDL boring. Um, and I think that uh, what what he means by that basically is to um, demystify and dispel um, this idea that anything that we're doing within controlled digital lending is somehow a new service. It may be a new distribution channel, but it's doing the same type of lending and borrowing that we've been doing for centuries. Um, a few definitions underneath the assumptions. Um, we're, we're keeping the number of physical copies and digital copies uh, uh, consistent and in sync between different inventory management systems. We're actually looking at different types of access control systems, whether those be single sign-on, whether they be loan policies, borrowing rules, and these types of things. The, the question is how, how all of this technology that we've developed in the physical realm can actually be applied in, in the digital or the electronic realm. Um, Loan policies, as I said, whatever a library can do for a print book, we should also be able to do for a digital surrogate, whether that be interlibrary lending, course reserves, general circulation. Um, all of these types of things are ways of, of trying to create a, a system that uh, is, again, doing exactly what we've been doing. Some of the things that are gonna be out of scope on my talk are actually talking a little bit about, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about copyright risk assessment, although that's something that um, every institution is gonna to have to decide in terms of kind of where they are, what types of materials they're willing to loan, how uh, inaccessible does a particular print copy actually have to be in order to uh, circulate a digital copy. Um, does the presence of a license actually uh, weigh into your decision about whether to lend a particular uh, um, digital surrogate of a print book or not? Um, the use of controlled digital lending channels in uh, for licensed eBooks is also something that's gonna be out of scope as well as document delivery. Although a lot of these different technologies, or a, a lot of these different uh, um, systems can actually use the CDL channels, and I'll talk a little bit about what some of those are. Um, each of these components, uh, I actually wanna talk and focus on the practice of controlled digital lending of the majority of, of, of our collections, uh, which is uh, material that's, that's in print, or I'm sorry, that's in copyright, um, or, or not necessarily within the public domain, that we want to make available in a secure manner to our patrons. Um, one of the things that I found to be very interesting, and I just attended a, a conference last week, 
um, was uh, the discussion from a state state library um, where because of mold, um, they had actually had uh, um, CDL copies of their of their books. Some of the physical copies were destroyed. Um, they were still able to maintain access to that content, even though some of those physical materials were um, had to be uh, treated for mold. Um, and so they were able to stay in business in a way that they probably wouldn't have been able to a few years ago. I want to thank everybody that's actually involved in the NISO group. You can see that it's just an incredible cast of characters here. Um, people from the Internet Archive, people from EBSCO, from OCLC, from Ex Libris, um, as well as uh, the university, uh, many universities. Hadi Trust is also there, Lyricist as well. Um, it really is a, a, a collaboration between publishers, between uh, libraries, and between vendors who are all working together to figure out um, what's the best way to do this? And I, I, I just want to thank both the Mellon Foundation as well as NISO for providing this safe space to have these conversations. The group, uh, the NISO group is actually divided into four different groups, although interlibrary lending and circulation have actually merged in some ways. Um, looking at file formats, as well as the description, uh, the bibliographic description of, of controlled digital lending objects, the discovery and what the channels of those are, whether those be um, OPDS strings, whether they be a description in MARC records. Uh, um, there are many different feeds that we can actually use to discover this material. Part of what we're asking is, what's, what are the actual things that people need to know um, when they're actually requesting a, a CDL or an SDL item. Um, some assumptions that I'm making here, we already have a lot of these physical, uh, these technological systems to actually do um, the work uh, that, uh, um, that the controlled digital lending needs. We already have digital asset managements. We already have a physical inventory system. We already have authentication and authorization systems. We've just never configured them in a way to, um, to think about things like a, a non-returnable that actually has a due date or a, a loan policy to an electronic item. Uh, we're used to thinking about full text as full text that's available to a licensed number of people or to a limited number of people but we haven't necessarily thought about a uh, duration. Um, these are the types of practical questions that uh, are being asked within many of the different uh, uh, systems of controlled digital lending. So as we look at the market, there are four, maybe five different models of, of controlled digital lending. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time actually giving you an overview of what those are um, so you can kind of get a sense of, of the different directions that different actors within the marketplace are actually uh, um, uh, deploying. First, um, the, one, of the, one of the models is called the standalone. And this really is, uh, when we talk about own to loan, we're actually talking about the ability to make a, a when a digital object is available um, and, and is in circulation, actually making the physical item not available or non-requestable and what that actually entails and looks like. Within many of these standalone systems that are being used for course reserves or other types of things, we're actually sequestering that material at the beginning of a semester. We're creating the digital objects, we're loading them, and we're making them available for an entire semester each loan may be a couple hours or four hours at a time, but the point is, is that um, the, the, the sequestering process is actually very non-technical. It's not necessarily tied to a physical inventory system. It's just the way that uh, these two uh, uh, systems remain in sync. Another, uh, another different uh, um, system here that you're seeing is uh, file open. Um, within these types of standalone systems, they tend to have local storage. Um, they are, again, no connection to the inventory system. 
Um, in this case, uh, this particular institution actually has a link to the CDL object from its uh, uh, EBSCO discovery service. Um, and you can see here that they have the option of, um, uh, if you look here, there's, there's a timer in terms of how much time they actually have uh, the item out for. They can actually close or return the document early. Um, they have access to the content, but they don't necessarily have access to print or do anything else with the item. Um, this way we're providing a certain level of access um, without, uh, without compromising the author's ability to um, uh, restrict the number of copies. One of the things that I, I did here was provide a flowchart of what exactly this, uh, what exactly this uh, supply journey actually looks like. So in this particular case, we have a CDL object that can be found in a discovery layer. It can be found um, maybe in an e-reserve system, maybe in a Canvas system uh, or a, um, a learning management system. There's an authentication process that happens. There's a, a decision that has to be made about whether the number of copies that are available um, or that are able to circulate, um, that there's a copy that's able to be checked out. And when it is, it's actually granted to the, to the patron. Um, this is by far and away the simplest uh, model of access. Loan is, is managed. Um, again, the physical inventory has already been pre-sequestered. Um, there is, uh, uh, the physical removal has happened uh, much earlier. And as I was saying before, we already do this with course reserves. So this should, there shouldn't be any magic around this. Now, an institutional model um, is something that actually has a physical or that has a tie to the physical inventory system. So in this particular example, you see, uh, um, see this with Ex Libris. Um, one of the things that they're doing is they're actually managing the availability within their discovery layer so that if a physical item is checked out, the CDL link actually doesn't appear in the discovery layer. Um, with this type of with this type of interactivity, um, it it really does tie this kind of own to loan scenario together quite nicely. In this particular example, you can see there's also the option to return early, um, and again we have the PDF viewer. Um, they're also notified uh, that uh, um, that a session uh, will expire. Um, you'll see here that. Uh, there's also a queue management system within the Ex Libris system. So if the item isn't available, you can actually be put on a wait list. Library Simplified does a very similar type of thing. One of the things that's different about this system is that rather than doing this in a browser, it actually does this through the exchange of files within, uh, within a mobile app. Um, so one of the exciting things about Library Simplified is that it's actually bringing together in a single application, licensed eBooks, controlled digital lending and, and scanned objects, instead of having different apps for different types of distribution channels or different vendors. So within this particular uh, uh, framework, um, there's a tremendous amount that can be done um, for things like, uh, um, uh, accessibility, uh, different types of uh, viewports and other, um, other uh, accessibility challenges that aren't necessarily available in some of the browser-based uh, uh, web applications. Now, I've been talking a lot about different types of own-to-loan scenarios and what those actually look like. Um, I've talked a little bit about the course reserves uh, uh, scenario where things are pre-pulled. Some other things that are happening is that uh, there are some systems that actually look at um, when a digital object is checked out, um, a paging staff member will actually get that item on a pull list and they'll physically take that off, uh, off of the shelf of uh, an available, um, uh, off, of a, off of a shelf. So the, the paging maintenance staff are not so happy with the, uh, the amount of activity that this generates. Um, some people have actually said it, uh, um, it, it's a way of 
providing the most access because you have the physical copy as well as the, the digital copy available. Other folks are moving certain things off site. So the requestability of the physical object is still there, but it isn't necessarily on the actual shelf. Um, in this case, when things aren't physically present, you're actually toggling the requestability of the item on and off. Again, if the, if the physical object is checked out, the digital object uh, link won't necessarily appear. Um, so that own to loan ratio of owned copies to circulating digital copies is maintained. Now, another emerging uh, trend that we've seen is that there's an approach called the dark archive approach. In other words, once something has actually been digitized, the physical item is actually seen as a preservation copy. Um, it's never circulated any longer. Um, only the digital copy circulates. And we see this in particular with uh, special collection types of CDL applications. With the institutional model, again, you can actually see um, the, the, work, the supply workflow here. In red, you actually see an additional check of the integrated library solution and what that actually looks like in terms of the availability uh, a check. Sometimes this is done through a protocol called NSIP. Other times it may be done through uh, a service called Z3950. But the point is, is that there's some communication between the CDL system and the integrated library solution. And one of the things I wanna mention is the institutional solution and the CDL system don't necessarily have to be the same vendor. Um, the point is to make this communication as interoperable as possible. Now the consortial approach is actually looking at something uh, in terms of the collective collection. In this particular idea, any patron can ask for any member's institutional copy of something and get a digital copy of this. This way you maximize both the scanning effort of the multiple members, as well as the uh, institutions in terms of uh, um, what can be made available to the uh, um, institutional patrons. Um, you'll see that own to loan tends to, e tends to be a real-time connection. What that uh, availability is uh, at the uh, providing institution could be any one of the four scenarios that, that, I, um, that I outlined before. The core problem here is because all of these assets are actually in a central system, now we're actually in more of an access problem than we are in a delivery problem. So one of the problems is if you have a, if you have a patron that has a particular single sign-on solution, how do you actually get them uh, to be able to view uh, an item that's in, uh, that's in another institution's collection? And so there have been different types of uh, um, access control systems that have been looked at. Project ReShare is certainly one of those um, where they've been looking at the problem of federated uh, authentication as a way of potentially dealing with some of those problems. And basically the idea is that for a particular user, access can be toggled on or off based on the token of the, uh, of the login session. Here you'll see the happy path or, uh, of the consortial model. Um, you'll actually see that there's a broker now in this system. It isn't just an ILS. Um, the broker is actually going around to each of the members and each of those members are then talking to their ILS. And once that item has been found and available, um, it gets sequestered at the member institution's uh, um, collection. There's a, a confirmation that there's now an accessible copy of that and the digital copy is basically delivered out. There's also a centralized version of this, which is no longer about a, a, an affiliated uh, or uh, a member affiliation, uh, like something like Easy Borrow or uh, um, Borrow Direct or um, Ivy Plus or any of these types of borrowing networks that you've heard, but the relationship is actually mediated through a vendor. Um, in these types of cases, um, either one of two things happens: either um, the the number of vendor or the number of supplying libraries is so large that it's recommended that most things that are digitized in that collection um, are actually uh, uh, sequestered um, rather than uh, uh, or put in some type of a dark archive. 
this way the traffic of asking for those availability um, can uh, can be minimized so that the content can actually be delivered to the patron as quickly as possible. Um, you'll see here, it's very, very close to the consortium model. In the consortium model, the members on the infrastructure in the centralized model, a vendor actually owns the, um, the infrastructure. This might be used in something like Hadi Trust or the Internet Archive or uh, Ex Libris' Rapido product. In this particular case, you see that the happy path or the way of actually checking this out is actually very similar. Um, except instead of actually looking at and sequestering the item, we're actually just looking at the number of available copies and we're reporting that a, a copy is actually able to be checked out and we issue that to the, um, to the patron. In this case, uh, you can check hundreds of libraries within seconds um, to see if there's an available copy. In the consortium model, you're actually looking to see what's on the shelf. In this model, things are, are uh, pre-sequestered in a way um, that make the availability checking much easier and much more centralized. Finally, there's a new emerging uh, a model that's being, uh, that's being talked about where uh, the, uh, the, the system is actually acting as a broker. And in this case, it's actually talking between different types of CDL systems and managing the interlibrary lending, uh, um, the interlibrary lending messages between the requesters and the suppliers. So interoperability for these uh, uh, ILL requests may, you may have reshare on one side, you may have uh, OCLC on the other, you may have uh, Ex Libris's Rapid in a third. In all of those situations, the networks are what are being looked at in terms of their availability and not just the individual institutions. Um, in this sense, a lot of the, a, a lot of the models are, are looking at um, different ways of interoperating uh, as opposed to providing a, a, a central institutional or consortial storage. So a few CDL challenges that, uh, that I've put up here um, if your institution is in this kind of institutional CDL system, does this mean that you can't take advantage of consortial CDL or central CDL or interlibrary lending? Hopefully the answer is no. One of the things that we're looking at with a new protocol called ISO 18626 is making ways so that, um, so that CDL requests are actually interoperable between library to network between library to library and between network to network. Um, in that consortial model, um, are we looking at a situation where you'll be able to talk to other, uh, other networks? Absolutely, that's another thing that ISO 18626 is looking at. Um, one of the other questions, and these are more kind of strategic questions, if you are in this consortial or central model um, and you decide to leave that system and migrate to another system, what are the access to the assets that you have um, that reflect your holdings? And this is important because if you're part of a scanned, uh, a collective uh, scanning collective, you wanna make sure that you actually have access to the assets um, of, the, of the community and not just those things that you've contributed because you've been relying on those links to provide that material to, to your patrons. Um, if your institution uses a file-based solution, uh, we wanna make sure that uh, um, the different requesters and suppliers aren't gonna give you something that your, uh, uh, that your end user won't be able to use. So making sure that the system information is available within the request uh, um, is an extremely important part of ensuring the maximum amount of compatibility. Um, the, the protocols and other types of information uh, um, systems that we're looking at. Again, I talked about 18626. Um, for those of you who are aware of open URL, there are different types of controlled digital lending um, use cases that are being built um, by some of the folks within the NISO group to try to model what a request for a print book in digital form would actually look like. Um, we're also working out some of the issues related to the mark holdings data and how CDL objects are actually represented. Um, those are things that are not necessarily under the scope of the NISO group, 
but there are things that uh, we need to make recommendation to the relevant Mark Holdings groups uh, within Library of Congress so that, uh, um, so that those use cases can actually be approved. Um, I, I might ask if, if, if you can go through these ones quickly as we're running slightly over already. Apologies, oh, Alan. Sorry. Yeah, no, I'm, I, this is my last slide. Um, the other challenges that we have, um, when a library owns a print copy, uh, are there other, um, what do we do for things that are uh, out of print? Um, and uh, finally, uh, we wanna make sure that we actually don't, uh, don't get involved in something called vendor lock, um, where the only people that we can lend to are people who are within, our, within the same type of systems that we are. I've included a couple of stretch goals here in terms of, uh, in, in terms of uh, what we might think about um, in different channels, whether that uh, having one application to include licensed ebook lending um, or other types of open access content. Ideally, we want a solution that's the same, uh, that's the same for all of these distribution channels as opposed to having a different app for every, uh, for every lender. Um, and the, the other question is, what are the scholarship possibilities now that much of this full text is being digitized that wasn't available before? Are there potential partnership models between libraries and publishers where we can actually collaborate to create this type of new scholarship? Um, so these are some of the stretch goals that, that I believe that controlled digital lending is offering. Um, I want to just thank you and I'll turn it back over to Stephen. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alan, and, and thank you also, and in particular for that final point, just that real reminder of you know, why getting these sorts of things working matters and what's, what's the real benefit. So given that we're slightly over, I'm going to go straight to Tommy at Caltech. So Tommy, I'll hand straight over to you and then we'll have the sort of summing up and the, and the questions at the end. So Tommy, over to you. All right, thanks a lot. Let's share this screen. And start my slideshow. All right. Hi, my name is Tommy Keswick. I am the digital. T tech Tommy, guy. you may need to reshare. Oh, it de it de shared. Yep. <laughs> oh, when I pushed maximize, that might have been what happened. Can you see this? This yes, that's that's working now. All right, that's good. Okay, let me move these zoom controls away. Okay. All right. Um, my name is Tommy Keswick. I am the digital technologies development librarian at Caltech. Um, I was involved when we first brought dibs up online and and I appreciate Alan's presentation describing um, the standalone um, situation of where controlled digital lending can happen because that is exactly what we have implemented. And I will talk a bit about, um, where's my cursor, here we go. I will talk about how dibs came to be at Caltech. I'll, I'll show a demo of what it can do and then we can talk about the system architecture a bit because I know folks are interested in how to potentially implement something like this. Um, so how it happened was when libraries all closed and all of our classes went online from the pandemic, we needed some kind of solution um, for people to get course reserve material because classes were still happening. Um, so first, the first in the first spring, we just put password protected PDFs in a file sharing app and it was clunky and we couldn't control people doing things with them, even though they were password protected, that sort of thing. So we were told as the digital library development group in late 2020, do controlled digital lending and as fast as you can. Um, so that's when we started investigating what we can do. And we didn't, at that point, there wasn't really any market for this stuff. We, we thought uh, everything, that we see seems a little complicated and might not meet our needs. So we started development in January, 2021, and we were able to de deploy it in March for the spring term. Um, so we've seen some of this stuff, the position statement uh, on controlled digital lending. Uh, what, what, I, what we focused on is trying to mimic the situation. Cause what, what we do at Caltech is we, use it only for our course reserves system right now. We, we try to take the minimal use case for this and we're absolutely open to a bigger implementation of this, but for now, our needs were to supply course reserve material to people who were not 
on campus or who needed access to these materials when they were away. And so trying to keep all these things in mind, um, that's, that's the direction we were coming from. So Alan's gone over a bit of this stuff, uh, particularly owned to loan ratio. So we know what that is about. Um, and make sure, and we wanted to make sure that only a single user could use these things at a time and limit the time period. So essentially, we wanted to do the same thing that a course reserves, physical course reserve system was doing. Like you walk into the library, you ask for the book that is on reserve, you get to take it out for a couple hours, and then you have to give it back. So that's essentially what it what we tried to implement on the web. Um, the other things that we wanted to, to, to use as we were developing this were we wanted to use our single sign-on system from our campus because everybody already has an account. And just for our own um, learning, we wanted to use a, a triple IF solution, which is International Image Interoperability Framework. Um, it's, it's a protocol for and, and standards for displaying images or serving images in various formats on the web. And then we also wanted to, to learn more with the Universal Viewer because we wanted to use that in other development projects. So we use this as an opportunity as a development group to, to learn some new skills. So in terms of the design of the system, some of the workflows that, that Alan was showing, we wanted to keep it as simple as the simplest ones or more. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we were respecting patron privacy by not collecting as collecting as little data as possible and, and getting rid of whatever we could as soon as we could. Um, and like I said, we wanted to serve our books using IIIF and then have single sign-on for authentication. Also, we didn't want to have tight integrations with our other systems for simplicity's sake, really. Um, so yeah, and some of our policies that we had to come up with that were just going to be discussed with our our access department and circulation department were that we want to pull them from the shelves, the books that are that are available in dibs. We want only one person to get them at a time, and we wanted to limit the amount of time that people can can get them. The other thing that we could technically implement was when a person checks out an item from dibs and then their time elapses or they've returned it, they are not allowed to check it out again for, I think we we set a period of 15 minutes, but it could be, it, that was kind of arbitrary. All we wanted to do is make sure that somebody couldn't repeatedly check out the same item over and over and over um, without giving others an opportunity to, to get in there. Um, we did not deliberately implement a queue or a reservation system because just beginning to think about that, um, got far too complicated far too fast because of time zones and because of um, how how can somebody, what if somebody doesn't claim their reservation? Like how, how do you make those decisions? There was too many decisions to make and we were in a crunch. We wanted to launch immediately and we got it out the door in two months. So let's take a look at what dibs looks like. Um, let me go. So first I'll tell you, I'll show you some from the patron point of view, because this is course reserve system, um, let me get in here. I should have opened one of these before. Um, people are going to come into the system through our course management system. Uh, I think we use Canvas here on, on campus. And so in, in that course reserve system, there's a link to this page, um, a page like this where uh, professor or instructor or somebody in charge of the class has has listed the books that are unreserved for this class and they put the link into the system. So students in the class know what books they have access to that are in dibs. So when they go to this URL, they will be first greeted with the single sign-on system. So they have to authenticate and then they're taken directly to this page. They never see a list of books. They never see anything else really about this except for a get loan button or this is not available kind of button. Um, so when I click this, I'm authenticated and it gives me a warning that it, I have three hours and it reminds me to use the end loan button if I want to return it early. As soon as I select OK, we open the book and it's showing this in the universal viewer 
And these are our IIIF um, versions that are scanned at pretty, pretty decent resolution. So you can zoom in and, and see everything you need to see um, for, reading, for reading the book. All the pages are here. This one has probably hundreds of pages. Um, and it gives an idea. This is a customization we made to the viewer of where we um, show when the loan ends. Um, and we added the end loan button in the interface as well. So that even though this can be checked out for three hours and that it will time out and they'll lose access at three hours, somebody can click end loan and they will lose access immediately. And they will need to wait 15 minutes before borrowing this particular item again. So if I go back to, so say I was that student and I went back to this, this book. I would not be able to, where did I put it? This, not that one, this one. It says, I am not available. I am not allowed to get this until later today in a few minutes. Um, this is a similar message that a student would get if somebody else had this book checked out. Okay, so that is the student experience. The staff experience is, is a lot more detailed in that this is how people can manage, our staff can manage entering information into dibs or books into dibs. Um, so users in the system are, are because we have a, a, a relatively small staff and this is a simple system, basically we have a file on the server that lists IDs that match who is a library user versus and anybody else, anybody who's not on the list doesn't get to see these interfaces. And so it's kind of a manually, um, there's a little bit of automation in, in creating the list and everything, but um, it's mostly a manual list of who can access this stuff. The way that we add material or add items to dibs is that we click the add new item button. And all we need to do is put a barcode in. So when the scanning department are it's the same folks who do our um, our interlibrary loan and our document delivery uh, services so they they're the experts in scanning they're they're experts at grabbing the books and, and doing that sort of thing with them they'll grab the barcode they'll come here put it in the system here I don't actually have one handy to to put in um, they'll add the number of copies that we want to put into dibs. So say we have three copies of the book and maybe two of them we want to make available digitally. They'll put the two in there to make sure we're at our owned to loan ratio. They'll, in discussion with the instructor potentially, they'll put the loan duration and any internal notes. We can also customize the cover image because we found that the cover images that were coming from our minimal integration with our, uh, our library system were not great all the time. So we can put a custom one in if we wanted to. What this does, because we're only entering the barcode, we have a, a small integration with, right now it's with Folio. It was previously with TIN. So we have we have integrations with both of those ILSs. Um, and they pull the title, the author, the year, that sort of thing for the item just by looking up the barcode. It is a simple query like that. And then that's how come we get the author and the title and everything here that we see on an item page like this one. Um, so that's how they entered in there. But once, um, I'm actually now I'm gonna switch over to the documentation that we have. This is available up on GitHub and you can see it for yourself. Once you've entered an item into dibs, it's not really ready to loan out because you need to get the scanned copies. And so our documentation does a good job of explaining what happens here. Um, so you've entered a new item. It doesn't have a checkbox right away. Like we saw here, there's checkboxes either on or off. If it's checked, that means um, it's actively available for lending. If it's unchecked, that means it's, it's the records in the system and we have copies of the scans, but Nobody is allowed to check it out at the moment. Um, and that's for various policy reasons. But before the scans are ready um, or in the system or accessible by the system, you're going to see a process button. And so what that means is the scans are still being prepared. And so the same people, often the same people who have entered the item um, will be scanning each page. We use a, um, a number, uh, 
a file naming scheme that is a, that's rigorous and we, we know what we're expecting there. And so the scripts that then can process these scans, once they're put in the correct directory on our shared server, um, they push the process button and that tells our scripts, go look for this item now and then process the images, turn them into IIIF compatible images that can be used in the universal viewer. It does all that processing and then moves them um, well, while they're processing. It could take an hour or two because sometimes we have thousands of pages in a book. Um, it's processing there. Once that's done and once the manifest file for the IIIF viewer is available, um, then you get the checkbox that's that enables the system to turn it on. Um, so it, it's a it's not an immediate process unless the scanning has been all done ahead of time. So that's how you can turn on an item in dibs. I think that oh let me show one more thing because this is of interest. We also try to keep some statistics about this that I can show off. Right now, there's not very many books active in dibs. I think um, this term doesn't have very many books on reserve from the system, but we can see average loan durations, total loans to date of all of these items. I don't know that there are any, you can see this is the one that I just checked out. So this is a little activity monitor. So every, the last 15 minutes, there was some activity. Um, but yeah, we've got stats about what's been in here and how much stuff has been used because our librarians definitely care about that. Um, let me get off of this demo now. I think I think that shows it pretty well. I want to go over the architecture of the system in a little bit more detail. Did I lose the share or we still see it? We still we still see it, although if you okay. could keep the three to five minutes, then we'll get on to David. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I've got only a couple minutes left. So let's look at this really quickly. This is similar to what Alan was showing. Um, what I showed you was basically all this. This represents, the DIB server represents the web application. So patrons interact with that. And so does library staff in terms of entering everything. Um, we've got single sign-on talking to that system, as well as a, a, a minor connection to the ILS to pull metadata. The rest of this is that scripting and scanning workflow that I talked about, where we scan files, images to the NAS, we do a script conversion, and we move them up to Amazon. And Amazon is actually what's hosting the, the images and the IIIF um, server, though it's not really a server because it's just a, a a process that can respond to requests it's not really on a server itself so and that's an open source thing i can it's linked in our documentation and i can share more with about that if there's a question so ultimately what governs this uh system is some python for doing image conversion and hosting the web server. It's a bottle application. Bottle is a framework for making websites with Python. We're, right now we're just using an SQLite database, but it's easily gonna be, it can easily be moved to MySQL or Postgres if needed to. Um, and there's an ORM for database interface in that code as well. Um, all that is up available on, on GitHub and you can see all of that. The JavaScript aspects of it are some custom stuff in the interface. The universal viewer is built in JavaScript, but we didn't write that code. We've only customized it a little bit. It's another open source project that's available. And the IIIF AWS um, Lambda function is available open source. And, and you can just, it's a one-click kind of install on your own AWS instance. That, that we got working. We didn't do any customization to that really. Um, so yeah, what we have done is the standalone CD impl CDL implementation simply for our course reserves. Um, it's the most conservative approach I would say. Um, and it uses Python, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and it it works for, for what we need essentially. Um, and we've got a couple of institutions that have actually tried to stand it up at their um, places and we're working with them to try to figure out what we could do in the main code to make it easier for people to do that. It, and, and it's going relatively well, I think. I don't know if they've turned it on yet, but we've been in good communication. Some things we wanna do is potentially make more links from the ILS records to dibs items. They manually go in and link to the course reserve system right now. I don't know if we care to do much more, but maybe we will. Um, and we may switch the database 
that we use by default. And part of our reason for choosing some of this technology stack was that we wanted to use with other applications like with Caltech Archives for viewing some of their special collections material sort of things. So, and there's always accessibility and customizability improvements that we can make. So that's it, thank you. Here are some URLs that you can find and I can share those again later if you need. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. I, I think thank you in particular for making those points at the end about it. These are all tools that may well be familiar to people in the first place, and plus this facilitates interoperability. So it's really sort of maximum gain, and it doesn't need to be complicated. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to David. It, it's an honour to have you with us, David. As I said earlier, President of Boston Public Library. So David, over to you. Um, thanks, Stephen. Um, thanks to my two colleagues who've already spoken. Uh, who have gone into a couple of different examples of the technical architecture and technical strength. I'm going to stay at a slightly higher level within uh, some examples of how we're using uh, controlled digital lending here at Boston Public Library. Um, I do want to recognize that this is an international uh, presentation today, although our sharings are mostly from the US context. So to the extent that we stray off the technological examples, of course, localized laws, regulations, policy matters uh, will vary. Uh, I also want to recognize that we are taking account of the last three years uh, driven by the COVID experience uh, to learn about the importance of digital access more broadly, uh, some of which also uh, continues uh, to this day. And so, um, let me uh, give you a little context uh, for who is Boston Public Library and what do we do? Um, so we are the first large municipally funded public library in the US and uh, we're the first to lend books in the US actually chartered in 1848, which I know by many other people, other country standards is not that recent, uh, but certainly for us is a uh, particular historical significance. I think relevant to today's conversation, we, we are also a member of the Association of Research Libraries, a founding member. And we're one of the original partners to the Internet Archive. And as you'll see in a moment, uh, the Internet Archive is actually our platform uh, for the deployment of controlled digital lending. So this is an example of partnering up to use an outside technology uh, for controlled digital lending uh, within certain circumstances so far. And I know we're running a few minutes behind, so I'm going to skip through several of these slides and just uh, bring out the salient points so we can get back on time. Um, so I do want to just note that largely our focus here at BPL has been on the published book and in other contexts, particularly in the academic and research community, uh, the journaled article, the publishers of articles and journals, um, data sets um, are just as relevant um, objects within our, within our digital family that we need to pay attention to. But most of our examples to date will re relate to um, actual published books. Um, I do think, however, to the extent that we're having this conversation within the broader library context, it is an existential question for us. The nature of lending and lending a book is essential to libraries. We do a lot more than that. Uh, but that remains very much at the core, whether it's in the public setting or in the academic or research setting as well. Um, essentially, uh, where we will narrow the conversation to in the next 15 minutes is looking at a book or an object published in physical form, in print, but lending it digitally. So we're not necessarily straying into the total of uh, controversy around ebook, e audiobook, and other e content forms but essentially an object published in physical form, can it be lent digitally and how do we do that and under what circumstances? Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I think the, the important point here is really um, that uh, there are other stakeholders and shared interests among readers, authors, publishers, libraries, distributors, and platforms. Be happy to define any of those, but want to recognize the broader community out of which comes this experience of publishing a book or writing a book and then consuming it. A few stats just to give you a sense uh, of it. And I've taken the year, uh, well, actually two years before COVID, and then I'll look at 2020 uh, in, um, 
2018, for example, we had 1.8 million downloads throughout the year. Those are mostly eBooks and audiobooks. And so I wanna just give you a sense of the scope of, of our experience and responding to our users um, and their demand for, for e-content specifically. And then just snapping, snapshotting forward in 2020, uh, the second year of uh, our COVID reality, uh, we, had, we had that number up to 3 million. So almost double uh, or at least one and a half times uh, what we had before. Um, so overall, if we're looking at the trends throughout 2013 to 2018, we're continuing to see people borrow books, um, uh, but with the biggest growth being in eBooks, audiobooks, and content. And then um, some physical books uh, uh, continuing to be in demand, other areas falling off. Um, there are four examples uh, that I want to um, talk a little bit about, uh, each of which uh, we have been doing with uh, the Internet Archive. And um, the first is an example of taking uh, the vinyl uh, prints from all across the 20th century. It's called the Great 78s Project. Uh, and where uh, we have fully digitized with the Internet Archive um, uh, all of that audio material, uh, you are as a consumer limited to only clips um, of most of that collection. Um, so this is one example where uh, control digital lending allows us to protect the overall uh, rights holders' uh, interests in those materials, but still allow uh, limited access to clips. Um, the second example uh, is in partnership with one of the uh, uh, publishers um, just went through an acquisition, uh, but basically bought, based here in Boston, uh, with their consent, we have digitized the entirety of their uh, trade publications archive, which uh, the physical copies of which live here at the Boston Public Library. And this is an area where some items would be in the public domain and we can lend as many copies as we want. Um, others uh, are uh, not yet in the public domain. Uh, and so, uh, as you heard from a couple of my colleagues, the model here is you have one physical copy, you take it off the shelf, you put it in some sort of dark archive, and you lend one digital copy instead. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's the model there. And I'll show you in a moment the, the links to where <laughs> you could find these collections on the Internet Archive of uh, various projects. The third example is a particularly interesting uh, one where I, you know, there was public interest in this out of print work, uh, a book called Wasted by uh, the author Mark Judge, uh, which became interesting during one of our Supreme Court nominees uh, hearings uh, as it sheds light on uh, uh, some of his experiences growing up. Uh, you can uh, uh, search for that if you want more, um, more details on it. Uh, but in this case, we had a physical copy of it. And uh, at the time, I believe the other copies were going for $500, $600 on, on Amazon. And so could we, the question for us was, could we make this uh, copy available uh, digitally? So we digitized it and um, we uh, initially were having difficulty getting in touch with the author who was the rights holder. Uh, we did ultimately get in touch with, uh, with Mark and uh, he allowed us to uh, make multiple copies available through the control digital lending uh, model. It also brought um, more interest in this work and uh, he with a new publisher then did an additional uh, print run uh, of that work. So it's another example where uh, use of control digital lending actually leads to the discovery and appreciation of out of print works, which then uh, can indeed drive towards a greater commercial interest. Uh, another project I would just want to mention is yearbook digitization, which is uh, particularly uh, strong to local communities, a strong interest in lo for local communities. Um, 
you know, uh, basically uh, it's a record of people's school days. And um, in some cases they wanna see that uh, made available. In other cases, they'd really prefer that that's uh, more controlled. So for collections such as these, we are exploring using controlled digital lending as a way of uh, continuing to make digitization possible, uh, but perhaps not having it completely open and free access. Um, so I wanna then uh, give you a couple of links to uh, where you can explore these for yourselves. Um, and I do wanna distinguish between archive.org, which is the Internet Archive's main website and has a lot of the public domain material that's available. You can browse to the library's own collections within, uh, within that area. And on the right, you see uh, the openlibrary.org project um, where different institutions are either using that as a platform for implementing controlled digital lending. Uh, I won't obviously speak on behalf of the Internet Archive and their own uh, policies and practices with respect to uh, books they are also making available. Um, and as we know, is, is of some, some dispute and controversy at the moment. Uh, and on the left-hand side, you see there the, the link to the Houghton Mifflin um, uh, trade book archival collection that I referenced earlier as one of the examples uh, that I am uh, citing here. Uh, and so uh, let me just uh, bring this to a close. And uh, uh, you know, if you were to go look at Mark Judge's uh, copy there, you are immediately prompted to either log in and borrow the book. Uh, there's also a link, of course, to go purchase it, um, which is now available. That wasn't originally. And then um, the renewal constraint in this case that uh, you can, uh, you can uh, if it's available, continue to renew it. Um, and obviously that is set in conjunction with, uh, with, the, with the technology. And so I, just really to bring some of these thoughts to a, a close, uh, you know, for us, we are really focused on you know, under what circumstances can we give access to a physical book um, through digital means, uh, and where where can we not? Either because uh, we're not comfortable with the risk risk level, or because the there there are open questions, perhaps legally, about how far that can be taken. Uh, the lending uh, in this context is a limited period for defined borrower borrowers, and on a pair copy basis, no more copies. Uh, than um, are available uh, in print, uh, just as we do with printed copies. Uh, we, of course, uh, believe that the right standard here is that uh, digital books really ought to follow more the printed book model. Um, although we have 15 years plus of the experience where uh, e-content follows more the software licensing model rather than the published book model. Um, topic for another day. Uh, and then any platform must have some form of digital rights management to enforce compliance with whatever rules the lending institution is comfortable with. And in our case, uh, examples where we have negotiated that with publishers or with in one case an author. Uh, in the US context, the hard line tends to be about commercial viability. And so if the rights belong to a publisher and they're not willing to release them, uh, then uh, the test really is commercial viability. This is particularly useful when it comes to uh, orphaned works where you may want to push the boundary if you're comfortable with it, uh, but not necessarily uh, interfere with rights holders' ability to um, earn revenue uh, based upon um, their exercise of those rights. And so uh, if you want to uh, explore more, here are four links. Uh, BPL.org involves a link to our catalog. You can look up a book there. Uh, you may be directed to our digital Commonwealth platform where there is uh, open access, Creative Commons um, content available, or to archive.org where, where many of our books are scanned, or to the openlibrary.org, which is the site that implements within our Internet Archive control digital lending. Um, for the sets of materials that we are making available there. Uh, so Stephen, back over to you and hopefully we're closer to time. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate you taking one for the team and, and cutting what you said a little bit short, even though you know, clearly 
Boston is, is such a significant public library and you're doing some really exciting things and you've taken such a sort of a forward looking role, such a pioneering role here. So um, I will hand over to Jenny. What I would say is we are live tweeting this. So I think you can just see it at the top of my screen if I point to it. I was checking which side of the screen it was. So do look at our Twitter feed, do retweet, do follow us and then use the hashtag KR21DIG in order to follow. So I'm going to hand over to Jenny now, over to you. So uh, thank you so much to all of our presenters and thank you to uh, Stephen and the and Ben and the folks at Knowledge Rights 21 for putting this on. If everyone can turn their cameras on, that would be awesome to start. So thank you all again for your presentations. They were really great. Um, I will say that someone is going to come bring me a cup of coffee uh, sometime within the next five minutes. So you all might have to talk amongst yourselves for a minute. But um, do, do we all own. get coffee? What was that? <laughs> do we all get coffee, Jenny? Well, everybody can can raise a virtual coffee to one another. Uh, it's uh, it's quite early here. Uh, I'm in uh, I'm on the West Coast this week, uh, but I'm usually in Boston uh, and a member of the Boston Public Library. So my first question is, I'm wondering if um, all of you can speak a little bit about um, the difference in experience with reading material um, that has been provided access to under CDL versus say like a regular ebook uh, that you might check out from your library or purchase from Amazon or another uh, vendor. Maybe David or, or maybe Tommy, I see you unmuting if you could kick us off. Yeah, sure. Um, this is actually a question that we get a lot when we when we talk about dibs to folks is like, what are the accessibility um, options in the books that you have in dibs? And unfortunately, my answer is they are just images. They're 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 not an ebook because one, we don't want to go down that path because we don't know the legal ramifications of it, of modifying a book and making it searchable and selectable and that sort of thing. But the other, it's it's technically more work, but also our requirements were to mimic the in-person course reserves um, experience. And that deals with, you have a physical book that is not, um, not searchable, not not any of the things that you would expect from an ebook. And so while it's not accessible, it it is it's it's readable by by cited users is is what it is. Um, and if and we have resources on campus for folks who need other accommodations and we are happy to help them figure things out that way. Um, we try to scan at pretty high resolutions and we've had actually some complaints and we've done a rescan of one or two items that people found were not up to quality, because, particularly because we have a lot of books with math formulas that have a lot of like suffixes and, and things like that. So if they weren't, if people couldn't see them, we needed to redo the book. So that's the, that's the, that's how I can answer that question. People might have other, other angles. Yeah, I, I think I think Tommy is right that certainly within the context we're talking about today, we're not getting into the ebook business, um, any of us. Uh, this is really more about giving digital access that to physic to objects that began physically, uh, began in printed form. Uh, and so I think that's kind of the beauty of this. Now, we, we probably have different standards or, or thoughts about whether you can get to full OCR level uh, resolution uh, in, on, it, within that uh, framing. Um, that would be, again, a question for each institution. Um, but if you're really asking me about the, how to compare ebooks and physical books, you know, my, my thought is that you know, it depends on your context. Sometimes if you're on a beach or on a plane or something, you just want to have a loaded up, uh, you know, tablet of some form and, and off you go. Um, if you're looking to do an information search or an academic search, then you probably want uh, access to the content electronically. But if you want a rich reading experience, I, I think you want to go to a physical shelf and pick up a, pick up a several hundred pages novel and um, page through it and smell it and remember visually how far you are through the book. So I think um, there, there are richnesses of experience 
And as we know from recent developments in um, the ebook publishing world, there is an online richness to some of the multimedia experiences that can be delivered. And that's, that's really way beyond what we're talking about here. Yeah, the, other, the only other thing that I would say is, is that I do think we are at odds with things like the Marrakesh Treaty and other types of accessibility requirements and this type of this type of delivery platform, making it universally available for any of our patrons as opposed to kind of the image based uh, the image based pages that that we're currently delivering. I think the other thing that we have to think about is particularly with um, with the way that uh, text lays out uh, on an image, uh, we need to think about um, what that looks like, not just in the viewport of the browser, but also what it looks like in a tablet and what it, you know, does it actually wrap the way that it's supposed to wrap or are we just condensing an ever smaller page on a, on a phone? I, to be reading those math formulas on a phone would be very difficult for anyone. And I think those are the types of uh, the uh, um, interface constraints that we have to um, that we have to take into account. The other thing I also say with David is that we have to take into account uh, reader tasks as well, particularly if you're delivering a chapter for a class. It's a very different type of reading experience than actually enjoying um, uh, War and Peace um, on the beach. Um, it, and I think that one of the things that's important for libraries is to be able to support both use cases and not, not either or. Although I, I'm happy to assign you War and Peace as part of your classwork as well, Alan, so we, we could do that too. I'm sure you would do. <laughs> I see, I was there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a classic told story. It's like, some great plot, then you have to get through war for uh, about 200 mm -hmm. pages. Um, as long as we can do that, maybe an ebook you can just skip it, might be, make it a little easier. Um, but I see a really great question in the chat. Um, and in the interest of time, um, I'd like to ask it, but I do want to actually um, uh, build on this question first of, of accessibility. Um, and just for um, Tommy and David in particular, so we heard from Alan a little bit about the technical restraints with accessibility within CDL. Um, but I'm wondering, um, particularly David, if you can talk a little bit about how um, the process of using controlled digital lending makes the Boston Public Library's collections more accessible to the public. Um, and Tommy, I'm wondering, you know, I know that you talked about how this basically tries to mimic uh, the physical reserves process. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how does um, the using CDL and using dibs make these um, uh, make make these reserves materials more uh, accessible in terms of access for students as well? I think, I think I'll split that question, Jenny, into two parts for us, uh, uh, which maybe was what you were getting at with the, with the first version. Um, it, it, you know, uh, there are accessibility guidelines for those that have particular challenges, whether it's about visual impairment or visual ability or you know, other types of challenges. And certainly in the US, uh, you know, there are standards such as um, the DAISY uh, technical standard for access to physical books. And so we've actually been participating in that work for, um, for well over a decade now to take existing um, printed materials and put them in this format uh, in a way that makes them consumable by people with, uh, with, those, uh, with those particular needs or challenges. And you know, in, in its earliest form, that is absolutely a, a form of controlled digital lending. Um, the restriction in that situation is that it's for uh, people who are certified to have access to this material that would not be otherwise available. I mean, our digitization work is the same, but making it available is the controlled or secure as the term is uh, for particular populations. Um, in terms of general access uh, for the public at large, uh, you know, 
the, 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 the BPL holds about 23 million um, objects. It's the third largest uh, collection in the US and uh, of, among libraries. And uh, much of that material uh, is not yet digitized, is not, um, even some of it's in the public domain, but uh, you know, just, you know, and people are not able to go browse shells because they're in closed stack areas. And so one way that, uh, you know, our work in this area uh, you know, allows us to do is simply make things available online. Um, and so, um, uh, Oh, thanks, Alan. Um, you, you can you can you can add that in a second. So um, uh, I won't steal the thunder on that. So um, uh, basically, it is a way of giving digital access to um, to our physical materials that others would not be able to to do. The COVID example is probably the other one that is really really important. Where um, for a year, year and a half. Um, most people could not come in, certainly to a physical library branch, if that was their experience, uh, and needed other ways to gain access to, to content. For some, that was, you know, our, we doubled down on our budget with our ebook publishers. Um, for others, it was, I just want access to uh, physical books, and um, we would deliver that uh, uh, digitally as well. So just a, a whole range of things. And the, the public interest now is in maintaining some of that level of work that we did during COVID. They, they have rightly gotten used to it and want it. And so it's our job to find ways uh, within regulations and laws to provide as much access as possible. Alan, did you wanna just go over the, the DAISY? Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to mention just because it is uh, an international group, the DAISY standard is actually used for converting uh, text to digital talk books so that uh, text-to-speech is available to uh, um, people with visual disabilities or differently able. The other thing I also wanted to say to piggyback on something that David said, um, there are many books that don't necessarily have ebook licenses that we found in our, in our institution where classes were uh, were severely impacted by the fact that there wasn't an ebook license available for some of this material because they're teaching with pre-2000 material where there isn't necessarily the same type of market. So how do you tell somebody to completely rewrite their course on the fly during COVID? Um, it, it was an incredibly disruptive time. I think CDL actually met, meets that need in a, in a very... Uh, a real tangible way. And it, to, to David's point, I think it is a service that people are expecting for, for that type of material that would otherwise be behind a, a circulation desk, a physical circulation desk. Yeah, that, and both of those answers are, are my answer too. Like our, our system was born out of COVID because people could not come into the library to get the course reserves. And so we needed to come up with something to get the get it to them. And it has um, stayed around, even though classes have resumed on campus, the library is open. Um, Caltech has a, has a big international community, so people are not always on campus. And so having this stuff available for anywhere in the world for people who are attending or working at Caltech um, is a benefit to people. So that increases the accessibility of this material for those folks, for sure, in terms of actually being able to access it. Um, the other point that that Alan just made, yeah, that I didn't mention it in my talk, but one of our policies is to only digitize something for dibs for course reserves if there is no ebook license available for the library, because we all we suppose buy it if we can, and we want because ebooks are generally easier to use for everybody than the dib system. Um, I mean, it'd be nice if dibs was super easy as an ebook, but like. People, people are accustomed to the ebook stuff already and we would, we're would we happy to buy it if we can. And there was a question in the chat too, like what do you do if people need another copy of the Dibs book? We'll buy that too. So it's, it's not like we're trying to be cheap by doing this. It's that we're just trying to get the this material that's not available otherwise to people remotely. And that, that's just what we're trying to do. That's it. That's a great, um, yeah. That's a that's a great way to end this 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 round of questions. Um, the last, the last question, although it might have been answered, 
Um, well, let's. Um, I'll just I'll just ask this last question from Megan because I think it's um, I think it's worth answering, which is a question of um, prioritization. How do you and your institutions prioritize what to digitize? David, how do you prioritize which collections would benefit from CDL? Um, Alan, how would you know a consortium prioritize uh, mass digitization of, of works? Um, I think Tommy, it, it seems like because Dibs is so focused on reserves, it, that's that's how prioritization is answered in your institutions. But for David and, and Alan, I'm wondering, you know, how do you um, uh, how do you and your library make make these decisions about prioritization within digitization? Yeah, I think I think it's comp it's actually a pretty complex uh, set of uh, processes because it's not like we're starting at you know year one from our twenty three million objects and just walking through the whole collection. I think there are um, certainly objects that are available elsewhere. Um, that's certainly true of much of our government documents holdings. Um, and uh, you know we're, we're we're always proceeding down you know things in our rare book special collections area as one set of priorities and most of those uh don't even come close to the public domain questions um and then uh you know our pilots that i referenced earlier at least this glossed over um you know, have been areas of interest or where we believe they're good examples of, of testing out how this would work. Ultimately, we want to be as responsive to the demand by our users and what we think our public will be interested in. That's kind of our, our guiding principles. But, um, uh, you know, broader than that, I think we're still very much at the early stages of working out what what needs to be digitized can it be digitized and is there interest in that in that collection and i'm gonna geek out here for a second so just bear with me this is one of the coolest things that um i i think about when i think about a consortial model of cdl because everybody can get involved somehow and what i mean by that is we're starting to see collective collection action and controlled digital lending starting to actually kind of, some of these conversations are merging in some really interesting ways. Um, you know, being able to uh, capitalize on shared labor uh, of different sections of call number distributions or, or uh, if there are different centers of, uh, of excellence in particular collections, being able to identify some of that material. And more importantly, even if you're not willing to circulate a particular item, you can check that item out to another library. So there's there's any number of, of different types of involvement that you can actually have within a consortial model that I find incredibly exciting. So you don't necessarily have to lend that digital object, but you could check the book out to the library so that another library can. And so there's some really interesting conversations that are happening at that consortial level that if we're just used to thinking about our institutional collections as ours instead of, of, of the collective, um, those conversations would never be possible. Yeah, I think Alan, that that's a really good point. In, in in some ways, you know, we have been doing interlibrary loan for years and years and years. And you know, how how is this in any way different other than that the format has changed? Um, and so I think or the I delivery think this, channel. Sure, right. The, the format and the delivery channel, right? Okay. Um, I, I I would I would agree with that. And you know, all of that's governed at least under U.S. copyright law by by fair use for sale. And so uh, we're not really doing anything that's anything. It's exciting because it makes access better, but it's just as simple and straightforward as 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 lending that we've been doing for decades. Thank you so much again to our speakers, Alan, Tommy, and David, uh, and to Knowledge Rates 21 for setting up this fascinating webinar uh, to close us off because it's we're at time. We could have had this conversation for so much longer. Um, I will uh, give it back to Stephen, who will tell you a little bit about what's up at Knowledge Rights 21. And um, thank you again for uh, coming to this as well. And um, have a good morning, evening, or afternoon, wherever it is, whatever time it is where you are. Thank you very much, Jenny, for that. Um, so 
Thank you once just to echo what Jenny said. Thank you to Tommy. Thank you to David. Thank you to Alan. Um, and thank you to Jenny herself for getting up early, for joining the webinar today, for sharing those really practical experiences. I think. Still have a set, you still have agency, you can still make your own decisions here is really important. So in terms of what's coming up next, um, we have another webinar which will take place on the 21st of November. Um, it's up on our website, so if you go to knowledgerights21.org, it's the leading story on the page and I will put the link in the chat for you now. That will focus, I think, a little bit more, not so much on the practical side, but on some of those sort of policy, the questions, the way the markets are working. So please do join us there. Um, you can put the link in the chat, so click on that, look at that. We will also upload the recording of this session, so you can listen again, ask. Um, of course, there you'll have the, the slides from our speakers, and hopefully you can check, you, you can find the answer to your questions, or you know which questions you want to ask next and go further. So with that, we're two minutes over, so thank you everybody once again for your time. It's great to have you with us. Please do look at those ways of getting involved in Knowledge Rights to 21. Follow us on social media. Once again, knowledgerights21.org. Keep an eye on our website and we really look forward to seeing you at the next webinar, if not sooner. With that, thank you very much and have a good rest of the day.